welcome everybody and uh, thanks for joining us. I'm just going to set up my screen to share a, a PowerPoint presentation. Uh, we're not going to spend a ton of time on on the PowerPoint today, but there are some some key things to get across with that. I'll introduce myself. My name is Luke Delwich. I'm the Entertainment Market Manager uh, based here at the factory in Middleton, Wisconsin. Um, and uh, I've been with ETC for a while, since the 90s, we'll say. And uh, really glad to be here with all of you today to talk a little bit more about uh, how Multiverse plays into the two new products that we announced this morning. And I'll let Erin introduce herself. Thanks, Luke. My name is Erin Giblin. I'm the West Coast, one of the West Coast Field Project Coordinators, along with Nick Psyche. Uh, you may have seen us both in the launch video this morning. Um, also, as I noted before, you're getting to see a lot of the West Coast office, which I'm very excited about. We don't get a lot of screen time normally, um, so it's really fun to kind of have you guys in virtually. Um, I was an integrator for ETC for a long time, and then I actually worked at City Theatrical um, in Carlstad, New Jersey. Great place. If you're ever in the New York area, wonderful place to visit. Bring the family all kinds of fun stuff to look at there. Um, but yeah, I, I do have some experience with the wireless, and so we're really excited to talk to you about it today. So this is the opening slide, and we'll, we'll leave it at that, that, you know, Multiverse and ETC products. And I will preface this by saying, you know, our, our goal here today is to tell you a little bit about how, how Multiverse fits into ETC products, especially these two new products. Um, we're not here to be the experts on Multiverse. We, we have those. Uh, some of them probably listening in from our friends at City Theatrical, um, and they're absolutely going to be the, the domain experts in this area. Um, but let's start a little bit with what is multiverse. And you know, I put the web address here, citytheatrical.com slash multiverse. This is an excellent uh, landing page uh, full of resources for you if you really want to learn about multiverse, and I, and I think you probably should. Um, but there's a whole webinar series. You can see the nice lady on the screen here um, that I pulled in from PowerPoint's stock library. Um, she was intently watching the Multiverse webinar series on City Theatrical's website, but there's a bunch of good resources there and user manuals and a white paper and like that. So I would encourage that. Um, you know, what is Multiverse? Frankly, it's the most sophisticated wireless DMX RDM available. And I think maybe I'll pass it over to, to Aaron to talk a little bit about more specifically what is Multiverse. Sure thing. Thanks, Luke. And I mean, the big thing that we look at, you know, with the wireless CMX solution is what's going to offer the best benefits. And we've really found that with Multiverse. So one of the big things we look at is the fact that you get a lot more data with Multiverse. You get up to uh, 10 universes off of one of our main transmitters um, with a lot less radio energy. Right now, the spectrum is more full than ever, you know, with cell phones, Wi-Fi, and depending on the venue that you're at, possibly your sound equipment, your clear comm, if you're on a film and TV set, everyone knows about Teradek. Uh, we really want to be good wireless citizens. So not only do we want to make sure that our signal is going to get through, but we want to make sure that other people's signal can get through. And with Multiverse, we can do that while having a really expansive amount of control. Um, there's also fewer transmitters that you have to set up. So again, that gets you up and running faster. Obviously, fixtures are using more and more data, seems like every day. Uh, so having a transmitter that can give you a lot of power right away is really huge. Um, and again, uh, really able to manipulate and optimize that for your individual setup. Uh, DMX and RDM are optimized uh, for unneeded traffic. So that means if you don't need as much bandwidth, you can get a little bit more power through, which is really handy, and we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Um, also really great for future-proofing uh, your system. So if you're putting something in place now, you're going to use it for a couple years. Really great for that. Forward error connection, that's something really cool um, that I really haven't seen anywhere else uh, that comes with the multiverse, where um, it allows the receiver to detect and correct errors that may occur in your wireless transmission of data. So it does lower your transmission uh, rates a little bit, but if you're in a really noisy or if you're in a mission critical scenario, this can be a really great tool to make sure that your signal is going to get through. Um, and then your show key security. So that provides a level of security for you. Let's say um, you have something going on in a main stage and you have a black box next door. You can both be running multiverse setups at the same time. I think of all the stages on Hollywood where you have one stage right next to each other. There's so much wireless traffic. This gives you a level of security as well as a way to set up uh, multiple systems at the same time. Let's say you have a big 20 universe wireless rig you want to use. You're able to set that all up at the same time. 
one thing that you'll you'll find with multiverse is there's a lot of numbers to think about and i put this chart together um to kind of help hopefully demystify it and this is kind of the the crux of this is that you have the frequency and the signal frequency range and multiverse um, is available on two different frequency ranges 2.4 gigahertz and 900 megahertz range but i'll be quick to point out that uh, etc products the new source for led series three the desire for now the existing phosphor panel phosphor for now and some other stuff um, only operate in that 2.4 gigahertz range uh, the 900 megahertz is only licensed for use in north america so we've elected to to build in the 2.4 gigahertz range into uh, products like the like the series three um, the show id and this is a really important one we're going to talk a little bit more about this one coming up but this is a sort of number that encapsulates not only the frequency but the data rate um, which banding you're working in and what the hopping pattern of that is and i'm going to come back to that <clears throat> as i go on to power signal power off low medium high or max and there's a little check mark there next to meaningful and what that kind of means is it really matters what you select here obviously the frequency matters and it matters what the show id that you select is and what the power level that you select versus the next two um, i've put a check mark next to arbitrary and that's the show key this is that sort of pass um, password as it were a, a pin number almost that aaron was talking about which allows you to say not only on, am i on this frequency um, this show id but this is my further security measure that I'm going to make sure nobody else is, is controlling my equipment and vice versa because I've set that number. And we're going to set this up in a bit, and you'll see that um, in action. And then finally, we have the universe number. It's, it's arbitrary because multiverse doesn't really care which streaming ACN universe you choose. You have to tell it which one you're listening to um, on the, the multiverse transmitter. But beyond that, it just works the same. So. Uh, Poking a little bit more at that show ID, this is an example. This is taken directly from uh, Cities, City Theatrical's website. Um, 24302, so the 24 is that prefix, meaning 2.4 gigahertz. You can see the data rate um, options that you have there. Do you want to send one universe, two universes, or five universes from each radio? Uh, the banding, um, it all is laid out there pretty clearly, I hope. but. Um, you can see do you only want to use uh, certain parts of the band do you only want to use um, the high band low band etc like that and then a hopping pattern um, which allows you to use the same uh, data rate and band but two different hopping patterns so if you wanted to have two radios set to the same number you could just change the hopping pattern and as it says here they'd be a lot less likely to run into each other so Finally, I'll say that there are a number of ETC products uh, with multiverse uh, wireless DMX RDM built in. The Phosphor panel, which launched uh, just over a year ago, the Phosphor Fresnel, which was last summer. Obviously, this morning, um, we launched the Source for LED Series 3 and the Desire Fresnel that you're going to see here in front of you. Additionally, we're uh, working on launching the an update to the Color Source wireless relay. Um, we're changing the radio in that product to be a multiverse radio. and Additionally, here in North America, the high-end systems HQ100 Hazer has uh, multiverse radio built in as well. So uh, a lot of different products there. Uh, Aaron, you were going to talk a bit about compatibility. I was, and that's a big question that we get a lot, um, both compatibility with our own stuff and with other folks. So I wanted to dig into this a little bit more. So of course, um, all of our multiverse products work with other multiverse de devices. So other fixtures that uh, we make that obviously Luke just showed there, and of course, everything from City Theatrical, as well as other manufacturers that are starting to adopt the multiverse protocol. There's also an option where you can put the multiverse into Neo mode, and that will be backwards compatible with the color source relay and with some of the older City Theatrical wireless stuff. And again, other companies that have um, put that uh, chip into their fixtures. So I think Cream Source here at the popular film TV light uh, here in Los Angeles, you could talk to um, the multiverse stuff and set up one um, show. There's actually a show that's running right now that they have some betas of the Series 3, they have Cream Source lights, and they have a multiverse transmitter, and everything's running really happily together. Um, so again, a big question that we get asked can the multiverse stuff work with something like Lumen Radio, the CRMX, or something like RC4? Unfortunately not. Um, all of those different protocols from different wireless manufacturers are proprietary. 
So while they can both all speak DMX at the end, and there's a lot of different ways that you can incorporate them into the same system, sometimes really beneficially, um, if you're operating in different parts of the wireless spectrum, they won't speak to each other right out of the gate. Um, we did hear that, again, especially I'm going to be sided towards the film and TV market because we live in Los Angeles. So if you have a CRMX uh, kit or something like that, and you want to use that directly onto our fixtures, we do have a powered USB port on the back of the fixture that you could use for your existing year um, if you've already made that investment. So that's just something to keep in the back of your mind as well. Uh, the next thing that we want to talk about is when uh, we should use wireless. So what are kind of the times that we're really thinking of when we're putting together a system that we'd want to look at wireless as an option. Um, and I'd say it really depends on what your setup is, how much time you have, what your existing infrastructure is. But the big thing with wireless is as soon as you plug in that transmitter and you get that up and running, you now have DMX available to you in every single part of your stage or set. You know, I have it in every catwalk. I have it on every part of my stage. I have it in the audience. It's available to me anywhere I want to pop a receiver. There's a great uh, example of this. Uh, if you're ever in Salt Lake City, the Eccles uh, Theater Regent Street Black Box, they wanted a really flexible setup. So what they actually did is they put Unistrut every two feet along the walls, and they have these pipes, and they have literally a bucket of receivers, of uh, show baby receivers, and they plug in wherever they want a light fixture, uh, wherever they want a lighting position. They will literally pop that Unistrut into the wall, turn a receiver on, they're up and running. So you can go with something extreme, as extreme as that, or maybe you just have a special thing that your director wants to do in the audience. And I think all of us lighting designers and programmers, we've had that moment where the director looks at us and they're like, we want to do this special thing in the seating. And you're like, oh my gosh, how am I going to get that out there? I'm going to have to run a cable and a bunch of ramps. No, just pop a receiver there. That's a really great opportunity to use wireless. Um, you can also use it in more, um, I'd say, traditional ways, more common ways. Um, if you're short on time and you need to get a bunch of stuff up and quickly and you don't have a bunch of existing infrastructure, I think of being on location. Um, you know, you're shooting a commercial, you're shooting a TV show, you're only going to be there for a day. You don't want to set up a whole big network. You want to get up and running really quickly. Having a good wireless system can make that a really great tool for you. Um, we're not necessarily suggesting for all intents and purposes for your permanent rig, especially if you're in a building that you're going to be in for a long time, to go with a fully wireless backbone. That is an option, but again, we think of it as another tool for your tool chest. Um, when it's possible to run a cable, when it's possible to have a nice, maybe a network uh, backbone to your system, we still do default to that. There's a lot of re reliability there. I know for myself, if I can see it, if I can plug it in, I feel really good about that. Um, so again, we really think of it as another um, possibility. Um, but again, for your temporary setups, you know, my band wants to play in the warehouse on the weekend. I want to put up a couple light trees. That's a really good way to take care of things. Do you have other examples, Luke, that you want to run through? Well, no, and I think that's um, that's part of it for me as well as I might say, ultimately, I want to run on a wire. I feel comfortable with that. Um, I know how to troubleshoot it and like that. But we're moving this light right now from position A to position B. The, the shot wasn't working, whatever the case might be. I can move it there, get it power, and say, it's on wireless. I'm going to come back to it and cable it later if I need to. But I don't have to, to think about that now. Um, I, you know, an example I, I'll give is that I did do a show in a, in a small theater here in town, um, and we had some some fixtures with multiverse built in. And I, I may have underestimated it before I went in how much I was going to love it because this venue it's really awkward to work in. You have to take a, a little giant ladder and get onto the bleachers. You have to raise one leg and lower it and crawl up there and tie off some cable and then go over here and you know this this theater used to be a radiator garage and it was built in the it was turned into a theater in the 1960s and there's no dmx infrastructure there there's nothing like that being able to just go up plug a fixture in and i've got dmx there it was invaluable it it turned what would have been a probably a two-day load into literally two hours so big fan and I actually, I wasn't going to tell this story, but Chuck Drew just asked a question about, is it possible to have uh, redundancy with priority using both wired and wireless solutions on the same fixtures? 
I did, I lived in Portland for a long time. I did uh, an event that would be somewhere between a protest and a drag queen competition. Um, so more on that later, you know, like you do. And we were really worried about the wired communication getting knocked out at this event. You know, there were a lot of people running around. There was a lot of stuff going on. Um, so we just wanted to make sure that we had some redundancy in place. So what we actually did is we set up um, a, a setup with a show baby, which has an in and out um, connector on it uh, to a bunch of lights and we had it running hard line. In the middle of the show, that cable got pulled or, or torn or something happened, we weren't sure what, and we said, okay, backup systems go. And when we fired up that transmitter to that show baby, the wireless immediately took over. Now, you may want to go the opposite of that, but I mean, I don't think you often hear about, hey, here's a really great way to use wireless as a backup system. It was very easy to set up and it was a really good thing to have. Um, so Chuck, and we will answer more of these questions um, throughout the presentation, but Chuck kind of answer, ask the right thing at the right time as we were talking about. <laughs> So the other thing that we want to um, talk about is kind of where we use wireless. And we've already kind of mentioned this a little bit, but venues that don't necessarily have a lot of infrastructure. Uh, so, you know, if you've ever toured and you walk into a venue and you're, you're like, okay, this is not what I was expecting to be in the walls. That's where wireless can really come into play and really get you up and running fast, especially with how many more universes we can do now. Um, there are still a lot of theaters out there that have hardline DMX as their network backbone. Maybe you're bringing in a bunch of movers, you're bringing in a bunch of lights that you don't necessarily want to add into the existing rig. Maybe you want to just uh, have those as extra for the day or the week, however long you're going to be in that venue. That's a really great way to kind of add things in on top. Um, also, as a permanent solution in some of these historic venues, maybe you have lath and plaster walls. Maybe you can't plug into the wall and run more conduit and things like that. That's where um, wireless can really come into play to be a permanent solution that's a little easier and you don't have to worry about, you know, breaking historic code or something like that. I also look at things like schools where if I have to go into the wall with something, I have to get an electrical contractor involved, I have to get the district involved, I have to get my IT department involved, which pro tip, never let your IT department get involved with your lighting network, always a bad time. Um, but you know, I don't wanna get all of that stuff involved, but I wanna add, maybe I got a grant for my first set of LED psych lights, or I got a grant for a couple of, um, new series three fixtures that I wanna put in my front of house, but I don't have a lot of existing infrastructure. That's a place where something like the multiverse relay can really come into play and really be a fast up and run where I can do that on my own. I can do it out of an expendable budget. I don't have to go through a whole big process. So that's something really um, helpful to think about too. And again, all those kind of temporary setups, if you wanna do something in your lobby, maybe it's opening night, or maybe you have a bunch of uh, sponsors coming in and you wanna do, hey, we're gonna put a gobo in the lobby to thank our sponsors. Again, multiverse, great way to do it. And then you can have control of it from your console or from your existing system. All right, so the next thing we wanna get into, and a lot of you have asked questions kind of leading us to this, is into the how. So how do I start to set up a network? Where do we go through? And we're gonna do some hands-on time with Luke in just a second, but we kinda of wanna talk about the process a little bit in theory first. So the first thing that we want to focus on, and if you've ever taken my previous wireless class, uh, which is still on YouTube, um, planning and communication. I will say it again, I will say it forever, regardless of what the technology is, you want to plan and you want to communicate. Those are the two biggest things. Uh, so planning, you know, how do I want to put my wireless in? How do I want to think about it? I don't necessarily want to walk in the door and just start setting things up. Can I do things ahead of time? Are there pre-production meetings? Are there things that I can do when we're scouting locations to make sure that I'm really successful when I get set up? So looking at the existing infrastructure and seeing where you can tap in, what you might want to use, what you might want to use as wireless, and what, what you might want to use in conjunction with each other. You know, maybe I have some electrics that already have some DMX in place, but I need some extra. Can I tap in from there? Can I add an extra wireless universe? How do I want to think about this logically so that it's easier to troubleshoot and easier to work with down the line? Um, finding out what's going on already. Um, there's a lot of great free apps. Um, MetaGeek makes a tool called YSpy um, that's a really great wireless survey tool. And now City Theatrical actually makes a wireless spectrum analyzer uh, that's really slick and it will even go so far as to recommend uh, what show IDs would be good to use in a really crowded environment. Um, so being able to come in ahead of time when you're doing your site survey, when you're doing your first walkthrough of a space, finding out what's existing in the space. 
you know, maybe you're going into a school and the school has an existing Wi-Fi network. They're probably not going to move that for you. You're going to have to work around that. So finding out what those mission critical uh, signals are ahead of time. Communication, talking to your other wireless users. You know, it's really nice to be able to slice up, okay, camera operations, you're going to be in this part of the spectrum. Lighting, we're going to be in this part of the spectrum. Sound, we can be in another. All of those things kind of divided out ahead of time can be a really useful thing. It can also be really great later on if someone's being too noisy in a part of a spectrum or they're um, operating a part of the spectrum they're not supposed to be or didn't say they would be. It can be kind of easy, easier to negotiate your space well. Um, and that's another nice thing about multiverse is it is easy to transfer to different part, uh, parts of the wireless spectrum. But because of the frequency hopping that they use, if you do have multiple things in one part of the spectrum, they can oftentimes coexist with each other. Um, so that technology really lends itself, again, to being a good wireless citizen, which, by the way, is a total phrase that I stole from Gary Fales and will use for the rest of my life. <laughs> Um, so some basic tips for the wireless setups. Um, I talked about a little bit of avoiding interference for the radio interference. Um, of course, Wi-Fi, if you have 2,000 people coming in uh, with cell phones all in their pockets, that creates not only physical interference, but also radio interference. So trying to test things and take wireless readings within a uh, environment that is like what you're going to have for your show. So have everybody start using their phones, try to get a reading for it. And of course, with Multiverse, we have the option to exist outside the place um, that wire, wireless typically is in North America. So that's a really great ace to have in the back of your pocket for when things could go a little haywire. The other thing I want to talk about is physical interference, which is something that people don't often think about. So things as simple as um, a lot of times people want to put their wireless transmitters in an equipment rack. Maybe your ClearCom uh, equipment is also in that rack. Maybe you have other wireless transmitters also in that equipment rack. Try to make sure that all of your transmitters are at least two feet away. Two feet is good, five feet is better. If you're starting to notice some interference, make sure those transmitters are spaced out from each other. Same thing with receivers. Um, I've seen sometimes, and it sounds so funny because you think they'd be able to talk really well, if those uh, devices get too close to each other, they can actually cause reflection. So making sure that you have a little space out if you're not getting um, good transmission. Um, physical interference can be metal, water is a big one, reinforced glass. So if I'm setting up in a simple, um, a simple uh, proscenium theater, maybe in the front of the booth, I've got a big piece of reinforced glass putting my transmitter right up against that glass. Hey, maybe it sounds really good because I want to get that signal out to the stage, but if it's reinforced, maybe it's just going to bounce and I'm not going to be able to get it through. So thinking about that kind of things, I don't want to put my transmitter in a DIN rail box. It won't be able to get out. It's metal, blocks the signal. Stuff like cement, brick, that kind of thing passes through pretty easy. So just things that I want to think about, again, when I'm planning, when I'm going through how I'm going to set up my system, where's a good place for me to put my transmitter, where's a good place for me to put my receiver. You have some other tips for that, right, Luke? Yeah, we do at the end. We talk about some uh, some tips for that. So, yep. Let's jump right into getting it going. And, you know, this is the exciting part, right? Because now I'm now I'm set, setting it up live and um, and it's all going to work flawlessly. So what I've got here with me in the studio, I've got a Source 4 LED Series 3, and I've got a Desire Fresnel, and I have a Phosphor, uh, two different Phosphor panels. Um, they're all set up on wireless. And I'm going to share um, my phone screen here, you should see this. And I'm running the, the app from City Theatrical called DMX Cat. Um, DMX Cat is uh, not only a technician's test tool that um, the industry has fallen in love with, it's great, uh, but it's also built into every multiverse transmitter. And I have one of those um, on the desk in front of me. So what you can see is I'm connected to it. Um, it says up here, connect to device. You can see all the settings. It's pretty um, straightforward and obvious how that works. But I have a number of different um, things on the screen, but one of them says multiverse transmitter. So now I can go in and it's talking to this transmitter. This is a Bluetooth link uh, from my phone to the multiverse transmitter. And you can see here under the labels, uh, label one is show ID 24201. That's what I've set my show ID to be. That's what I've decided for, for my setup that I want to use. And you can see four devices on there. Um, a bit about how I would change that. I'm just going to use this arrow sort of at the top and drop this down. And you can see not only can I just type in the number 24201, I can also go in and kind of more of like a wizard-like interface, say like, well, how many... How many universes do I want? One, two, or five? And City Theatrical has all sorts of good resources about what might guide you to these decisions. 
um, what band do I want? What hopping pattern do I want? And I've set a show key as well. And just to reiterate this, that show key has to be the same on the transmitter as well as any receiving device. So I've, I've chosen 382, um, just so people don't think that they've now cracked uh, what my uh, bank account PIN number is. That's ETC on a telephone. So, um, but I've chosen 382 for my, uh, for my setup here. Um, I'm gonna switch over now to this camera. And this is pointing at the back of my fixture. And I'm gonna go in. You can see my DMX address is 101. This doesn't change. This is not gonna be different between multiverse and uh, straightforward DMX. This is just my DMX address, my modes, all those sort of things. I'm gonna go into the menu. You can see it's blue. Hopefully you can see that on the screen. It's a little bit blown out. So I'm gonna use the blue encoder, say multiverse settings. And now I get to change, okay, which universe? This is my streaming ACN universe essentially that I'm listening to. What show ID, you can see that that matches. I could change it here, 24201. Show key, 382. Again, ETC on a telephone, not my bank account. And my power level high. Now, I definitely don't need a high power level for my setup here. I'm about you know, less than a meter away from it, but I'm gonna leave it at high and just say save. So what I'm seeing now, and I'm gonna switch back to uh, my presenter camera is, uh, I'm just gonna bring this fixture up. So I've got EOS running here. It's sending streaming ACN directly into my multiverse transmitter. Nice thing about multiverse transmitters is they are PoE. So this is running through a PoE switch. And the moment of truth, will the light come on? Hooray, it did. So you can see it in a nice blue color here. I'm changing the colors with the color picker. Um, just in case you don't believe me, we're gonna go to the white wall view. There it is. So I've decided for this particular scene that it's gonna be a very deep red coming through the window. So that's all working really well. I've got also next to me, I'm gonna switch back to this camera, uh, Desire Fresnel over here on this side. So select that one, bring the intensity up, there we go. This has the same settings. Obviously it's not exactly the same settings because my multiverse settings are the same, but it has a different DMX address, just as if I were running it with a DMX cable. Same thing with the uh, FOS4 panel behind me. You should see that coming up. There it is, kind of in a nice, Oop, they're very bright. Do apologize. There we go, that's better. And right, we'll run it at 4%. Um, and I've got the other uh, phosphor, the smaller PL8 behind me as well, and same sort of thing, um, bringing that intensity up, changing the color. So very quickly, I was able to just go in and do all of this. And the reason that I was very quick, to, able to do this very quickly is because I planned ahead. And this is the sort of soapbox moment, but I'll say that you do save time using multiverse. You don't have to run all those cables you need to use some of that time for planning. It's probably not gonna be all of that time, but you don't just walk in and hope for the best. Hope is not a strategy. Um, you plan ahead, you say, what's gonna be the right way to do this? I know I don't need 10 universes, so I'm only gonna choose four. Um, I know that there's some risk that somebody else could use the same ID. Frankly, it's pretty unlikely here at the factory, but just in case, I'm gonna set a show key of 382 and I'm gonna patch and all those sort of things and plan ahead. So uh, that's the long and short of it. Frankly, there's not a ton of other setup that you need to know about. The kind of next section we had planned to go into is sort of a troubleshooting section. Um, and I'm gonna go back and share my screen. And when we talk about troubleshooting, I'm gonna harp on this again, but pre-troubleshooting, this is really the first step of what's in the air. And Aaron mentioned it earlier, and I'm gonna mention it again, the City Theatrical Radio Scan. It's a great tool, um, costs a few hundred bucks, it plugs into your computer and allows you to, to do a lot of cool things. Um, there's a spectrum analyzer in it. As Aaron mentioned, you can go in and actually map what the various show IDs um, for multiverse would look like over that. It can give you guidance toward which one you might choose. It also allows you to log over time. And this is a really important thing. If I'm planning ahead for, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna use some multiverse in this venue, just doing a snapshot in time with a, you know, a simple iPhone app or something like that to say like, oh, it looks like I should be able to use this. It's not a very good strategy. I wanna see, okay, 
that's what it is at this very moment in time. But what is it like during the day? What is it like when um, 2,000 people come in with their mobile phones? What does it look like under these other circumstances? What about when we turn uh, the radio microphones on and make wiser decisions about how to set up my multiverse system based on that? So, Aaron, do you have anything to add on that? Um, maybe someone from City Theatrical can tell us, but I also believe, and I know this is gauche, but um, it's very affordable. Um, like it's a very low cost device. They have a whole um, uh, class that you can watch on it, uh, but you're able to take snapshots of the wireless ne network uh, readings and text them or email them to people really easily as well. Yes, so again, that's really cool. Plan, yeah. communicate forever, put it on a t-shirt. And part of that planning and communication, the, the app allows you to put notes in um, either just on the spectrum or during that snapshot over time to say like, this is when we turned the wireless mics on, for example, or this is when uh, the, the huge microwave tower that's a set piece uh, was turned on, something like that. Um, so it's, it's a very cool tool. I can't recommend it highly enough. The first set of troubleshooting is antenna orientation. Um, this is a very technical looking diagram about dipole axes and things like that. But what it comes down to is the antennas that are sticking up from the multiverse transmitter and that are um, on the devices have a sort of donut shape to them. And you can see that a toroidal shape. So I found this, this nice donut as a stock 3D item in PowerPoint. So I thought I'd use that as a metaphor. Um, so this is what it looks like. There's a donut going around. It's a much larger is what is pictured here, but a large donut going out uh, from that antenna. And what you want to do is orient the antennas like we've got here so that the donuts overlap. Um, what you don't want in the one below is you see that one antenna is pointing straight up, another one is pointing perpendicular to it. Those donuts are less likely to overlap. Now, I did mention earlier, they're, they're quite a big donut, so there's a good chance that they still will overlap, um, but that's a good, good thing to know and a good first sort of troubleshooting step. I'll also mention here, I can show it uh, live if anybody's really interested, but in the menu of the, uh, the source for LED series three, desire for now, the phosphor fixtures, there's a diagnostics menu that allows you to go in and see what the multiverse levels coming in are. Um, it has a bad packets and what your signal strength looks like. This also gives you the levels that the emitters are being driven to. I will mention that seeing some bad packets is normal. So don't panic if you see that. Um, that's just multiverse doing its job. This is very helpful though, to especially that signal quality, to be able to look in at that and say, okay, what change did I make? Did it improve it? I will also add to that, having worked with it, um, even just in our own facility where there's a lot of glass, there's a lot of reinforced metal walls, it took us a really long time to be able to get the to get the signal to go down. Um, we were just kind of playing with it when we first got it, and we actually had to put the transmitter all the way at the end of one side of our warehouse, and we had to go through the warehouse and through all of our offices behind a metal wall to finally lose signal. Yeah. Um, so it, it is impressive, and that readout can be really, really helpful. Some obvious troubleshooting steps here, and this is, you know, troubleshooting 101 really, but grab another fixture. Do you have the same result? This is the beauty of, one of the beauties of multiverse is it makes it easy to just say, I'm gonna grab another fixture, set it the same, what does it do? Move the fixture closer, do you get the same result? Do you get the same result with a different show ID? Remembering that those show IDs aren't just arbitrary numbers, they have a meaning to them. So what happens if I put it on uh, one, uh, 141 instead of 241, that sort of thing? Do you get the same result? Um, and you know, I, a little question, did hundreds or thousands of new wireless devices just enter the space? Obviously that's in a theatrical environment where uh, uh, a thousand paying patrons just came in and uh, with their mobile phones. Aaron touched on this a lot earlier, interference. A really, you know, a really important thing to look at, not only physical interference, but other wireless interference. Did the wireless ticketing system um, just get installed and now suddenly it's on exactly the same frequency? As an example, that radio scan would come in very handy at that moment. Now we're to the real questions and answers. This lady has a question. Why did you use papyrus font? So. And I actually, I think, tried to list out some of the questions uh, that we've been getting. So, Ginger, I think you have that list. I do, yes. So, from the multiverse software, uh, can you see things like signal strength, interference, wireless stats? 
Yeah, you can. Um, I'll fire this up. And bring that display up. It's going to reconnect here. I'll bring up the phone. So I'm going to go in now to this multiverse view, the same one I was looking at earlier. You can see I've got four devices here. Hit the right arrow. And now I can go in and look at this. I'm going to look at the Series 3, the one right here next to me. There's some, some neat things in there. Obviously, I've got an identify function. Um, for those of you who's RDM, you're familiar with this sort of concept. It's flashing the light. I can also go in and look at the actual RDM details. So I can see um, all my sensors and things like that. And I think... I think that I can see the, the wireless strength. Maybe I'm wrong about that. I know that you can on things like a, a show baby um, at the other end. Yeah. I will also note while Luke is looking at this, uh, he is live from our virtual demo studio. Uh, so if you like this studio and you need a demo of any of our fixtures, you can actually book those online. Um, so kind of a handy thing while we are still in COVID times. I will also just, because I'm that person, the Mori effect that you're getting on the panel behind you, I don't think you can see this, Luke, but um, uh -huh. at least on my transmission, there's a little bit of flicker thing happening. That's not the light flickering. Um, that's a moray effect because there's a, a louver over the top. There's a hexagonal louver. Um, so it's just it's it's just that happening. I promise the light isn't flickering. <laughs> Anyone from Villaman TV right now is looking at that like, oh my gosh, how can they have the light flicker on camera? No, it's actually um, yeah, it's just the louver. So sorry, I I would not be able to sleep tonight if I didn't tell you about that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, do we want to jump into other questions, Ginger? Sure. Uh, all right. Let's see. Uh, Jeff had the question, can you send DMX via multiverse to one of the ETC fixtures and then output DMX hardline to other fixtures? Yeah, good question. We don't have that capability built in right now. We are looking at adding that um, to essentially be able to use a, a multiverse fixture as a, uh, a transceiver. There, you know, there's, there's advantages to doing that. There's also um, some disadvantages. So we are evaluating that uh, right now. And Ethan's wondering, now that it's integrated into ETC's lighting fixtures, are there plans to integrate wireless into future consoles? Interesting uh, question. And, you know, maybe. Um, I, don't, I don't have a strong answer on that, but it's, it's certainly something we can look at. And what, is that a valuable thing that enough people would use that the additional cost that that might put into a console, would it, would it be worth it for people? But it's, a, it's an interesting question. I would also add to that, I, having done a lot of wireless systems, I do a lot of troubleshooting. And one of the things I like to troubleshoot is, okay, where is my console versus where is my transmitter? If I'm on a stage for a film shoot, it might be easier for me to take my transmitter and rather than having it be right next to my console, if I'm programming from a stage next door and looking at things on a monitor, I might do one little DMX or one little network run out to the stage next door and have my transmitter go from there. Um, so by putting it in the console, like, yes, you have it out of the case right away, but like it gives you a little bit more flexibility when it's outside. So to Luke's point, for the added costs, it might be better to have more of that flexibility. So just a thought. Same thing, maybe I want to put my transmitter on stage because all my uh, receivers are on stage. So just just a thought, but good feed. I mean, we'll pass that to the, um, to the EOS team and um, give them that feedback. All right, Kelly's wondering, in what situation would you set the wireless connection to a setting other than high? <laughs> you know, uh, Aaron, you probably have better knowledge of this than I do. You know, I, I've run into it a lot. Um, Spokane, Washington, and the Tri-Cities in Washington, um, big whoop to anybody in Eastern Washington, um, there's a lot of government activity there. And while Wi-Fi and cell phones don't operate there, there can be other things. Um, so again, doing a wireless spectrum reading, maybe I read out and I'm like, hey, there's something, I don't know what it is, either in 2.5 or in the high part of 2.4. Um, so again, kind of figuring out, okay, where's another better place for me to be? Um, 
in those scenarios. I'd say a lot of people start with high. Um, you don't necessarily get as much transmission power. So if you need to go really far distance, you don't necessarily get as long of a distance uh, operating in high. So if I need to go 1500 feet, maybe I don't want to go with that. So um, all of those, really good question. I think a lot of people, especially in theaters, um, will probably start with high, um, but it just depends on what else is out there. And when I did ask this question uh, to Paul, who's the, the lead engineer on this at City Theatrical, his answer was that, you know, you do run some risks if your rate is higher than it needs to be, that now you're just introducing reflections where they wouldn't have existed before. Um, he didn't think that there was a great, there's not, you know, great reasons that you wouldn't leave it on a high value at the fixture end, but on the transmitter, you might be more likely to do that, to bring it down to medium or low. So I think we just answered two different questions, Luke, and I want to parse those out. Okay. The question as I read it was uh, putting your wireless setting other than high, I thought you meant in the high part of the spectrum. So uh, when you choose where you're operating, you operate either in low, middle, high, or max, which is bands 13 and 14 of 2.4 gigahertz. So I read it as, would you <laughs> want to operate in the high part of the spectrum? But what I think you read correctly is turning your wireless power up to high. And so one thing we'll add to that, which Luke, you kind of tapped on, is being a good wireless citizen, if you turn it to medium and everything's working, that kind of gives you room to go to high if you are running into other um, things. But like you said, Luke, it gives you a – you're a good wireless citizen. So. Yep. Is it possible to run a DMX cable and a multiverse at the same time? How do you set the universe num number on them? Yeah, absolutely you can do that. And the, the universe setting does not apply to a DMX cable. It's always the universe of DMX. Um, and at that point, if you have a, a copper DMX connection, it will use that. It'll bias toward that over the wireless. So that can act, as Aaron was talking a little bit earlier, about as a, a sort of backup situation. If that DMX goes away, wireless will take over. OK, uh, another question here. Oftentimes with wireless, we don't know the issues until showtime with real show conditions bodies in the seats, cell phones in the space, et cetera. Sure. If I need to switch to a new frequency, will I need to adjust the settings on all the lights or just the transmitter? Just a good question. Yeah, you would need to do it on everything um, because they need to be, that, that show ID does need to match in between the transmitter and, and every receiving device. And that is, you know, I've said it before, I'll say it again. That is one of the beauties of the, the product from City Theatrical, that radio scan, is that it does allow you to not just do a snapshot in time. Um, you might run that test and say, okay, it's looking great right now. What does it look like for the next six hours as people enter the space? Um, how does that change in my venue? Yep. Let's see, if uh, Nathan's wondering if wireless drops, what is the time to reconnect, assuming interference was temporary? I can take that, Luke, if, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, so with that forward error connection, like if you're really, again, mission critical, I think of uh, live on camera. Like I know that we're going to be rolling. I know how expensive that time is. I do not want anything interfering with that. And I know that the camera department has some crazy wireless that can take over. Um, that forward error connection can help with that. So it will run really seamlessly. Um, time for reconnecting, it is instantaneous. Um, but it's, it depends on how long that interruption is. Um, you have to think about the fact that um, wireless CMX is moving faster, but DMX moves at 44 hertz. Um, we as humans see a seven, uh, see about a 30 millisecond latency. Like that's when we can start to see latency. So if you have an instantaneous interruption, you're never going to see it. It actually happens all the time. Um, there's a really interesting white paper on City Theatrical's website where City Theatrical and some other wireless manufacturers went into a, a closed chamber and did a test for how many missed packets. You can kind of dig in just depending on your level of nerd. But suffice to say, regardless of, you know, what wireless protocol you're working with, you're missing packets. Like, it's just going to happen. It's just the nature of the beast. And that's what Luke showed on the back of the picture before. You're really not going to notice it. Um, if you do start to, you know, look at things and notice things, that's when you can go and start to troubleshoot, and you'll probably see a lot more of those missed packets. Um, but that forward error connection can be a great way to mitigate that ahead of time. Uh, Nicholas is wondering, I guess, attendees are uh, to 
DBI Omni. Uh, can we swap those out for others with more gain? Matt, uh, oh, sorry, Nicholas, I am going to assume that you are in North America. If you're not in North America, please look at your local restrictions. Um, but you have a lot of different options in North America. Um, it's relatively unregulated, especially in 2.4. Um, so yeah, you can absolutely swap those out for different antennas. Um, there's two major antennas that we talk about. One is omnidirectional. Uh, that's what uh, Luke talked about with the donut signal. There's also directional antennas or panel antennas, Yagi antennas if you're getting really fancy, and those send out a directional signal. So think of a cone of light like from our new Series 3 fixture. That's kind of the direction. When I'm planning a bunch of um, wireless transmitters and receivers out together, I will actually use, if I'm drawing plans, I'll actually use fixtures um, kind of to see what that signal is going to be, what that cone of signal is going to be, um, and see how they overlap. So two things to keep in mind when you're upgrading antennas. One, that's more noise for other people. Two, both your transmitter has an antenna, and it's, it's sending signal out and your receiver has an antenna and it's reaching out for the signal. So one doesn't necessarily have to hit the other because they both have those donuts of signal or those cones of signal. Those just have to interact. Um, so again, just depending on what you're looking at, I always get nervous with that question too, because I'm like, oh, like don't put like some big beefy antenna and try to blow everybody else out of the water because then it just ends up at a shouting match. Um, but Nicholas, definitely reach out to us if you're like, oh, like I, you know, I work outside a lot or I do something like that. We can definitely help you plan as well as City Theatrical. I think I could be wrong that they have a class on antennas. Um, I could be mistaken, um, but they are really good with antennas as well and they sell them. So they're a great option to look into. Cool. Um, let's see what else. Uh, when using the multiverse menu on a fixture, how do you change what universe it listens on? Yeah, sure. I can show that. Um, it's it's pretty straightforward. And for those who haven't seen, you know, you may not have seen this user interface before because it is brand new. But you're looking at it here. So I go in. I hit the uh, the three lines, the hamburger button and go in and I select multiverse settings. And now I have color coding here. So I have a green, blue, and a red dial and a white dial. It may not read especially well on the, the GoPro camera. And then on the screen, I have white, green, blue, and red fields. So if I wanted to change to a different universe, I could say six. And then I hit the save icon uh, down here, green button. And now what I should find is it's not working anymore because I've set the wrong universe. My light on EOS is patched on universe one. I've told this, hey, I'm interested in universe six. It's not going to work anymore. But if I change that back to one and say um, pretty instantly, it's now going to be in control. And I can see, did I change it correctly? Oh, I also inadvertently hit the green button to change the show ID. I'm trying to trick myself. Oh. So, yeah. Good question. Another question, if the light is receiving conflicting data from wireless versus wired, which would take the priority? Uh, the wired will always take priority. Yep. If the, if the wired DMX is present, it's listening to that. And I did want to add in one of our friends from City Theatrical said the radio scan list price is 380. Um, just for reference, the MetaGeek, which I mean does more than the um, City version does, but for a lot of what we do, it's not really necessary. Um, that's between seven fifty and fifteen hundred dollars. Um, so again, good uh, cheap option from City Theatrical. I will take my royalties in um, either Pasta Primavera or um, the Supresa sandwiches from down the street from the factory. Thanks. Got a question from Daniel. How widespread is multiverse in Europe? I've mostly heard about Lumen Radio over here. Uh, Luke, do you want to answer that because you used to live there? <laughs> well, I, I know that City Theatrical's uh, standards are, are quite popular, at least in the UK. Um, City Theatrical does have an office there and have had a lot of um, success in the UK. As to other areas of Europe, um, I guess I would defer to them to answer that question, but they're not online. So um, I guess I'll say if it's not great right now, it will be. How about that? Uh, we've got a question about how do you choose which universes the transmitter sends? Uh, that's set using the DMX cat 
app. So you what you're what you're basically doing is going in and saying to the DMX cat via the Bluetooth link saying, I want you to listen to streaming ACN universe five for this um, output on this radio and kind of mapping that in. And again, it's part of that planning process. It's just another um, column on your patch sheet, perhaps of how you want that to lay out. Got an interesting question from Peter. Uh, is there an easy way for colorblind users to use the buttons? Which I thought was. Oh, on the, uh, the series three. Um, I don't have a good answer to that. I would say that you know it's pretty obvious when you start turning something what it's changing on the screen as well, um, and I I don't know that it would be a huge barrier, but I'd be interested to see what feedback there is around that. Yeah, they do kind of line up in order from top to bottom, left to right. So for um, North American users, that's very intuitive because that's usually um, the order in which we read things. Yeah. So I'd say that's probably the biggest thing. And just depending on how, like what type of colorblind you are, they are pretty saturate. Um, I don't know if that's coming through on screen, but they're pretty, um, they're pretty intensely colored. Uh, so I think that might help too. Um, you know, they're pretty uh, distinct. So just depending what, on what you're seeing. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, Matt had a question. When using SACN, does RDM show up in EOS's patch screen, like if it were hardline DMX, or do you have to use an external tool? Uh, it's a really good question. The answer is right now you'll need to use an external tool. Now, um, you can do that within the City Theatrical DMX Cat app. Um, that has a whole RDM uh, implementation within it, so you'd see all that information um, in the same way that you saw it directly looking at the multiverse view. Um, and additionally, and this is a, a webinar that I'll start in an hour and five minutes, which is all about the Setlight app, which is a reasonably new app from ETC that also has a blue, t takes advantage of that same Bluetooth link to the multiverse transmitter and allows you to, to see those settings. But right now to EOS, because um, there's not we haven't yet put in the new standard, uh, which is called uh, for RDM over the network. Um, we don't have that ability to a multiverse transmitter to have that information to a show baby, which is old school uh, wired DMX based RDM. You will see that. Uh, we've got a question here. Um, and I said it may be a silly question, but there's no silly questions. These are all great questions. Um, is there a style of queuing that is less suited to wireless control, i.e. seeing a fade from zero to 100 over 20 minutes? Would loss of packets be more visible in a situation like that? I can tackle that one if that's okay. Yeah. Um, you know, City does a really great job, and I know we keep referring to City, but like they made it. Um, they have a really great uh, description in their first class about multiverse about how to kind of choose the different settings. I guess the answer to that would be if you are doing something really um, like, you know, slow fade or on camera or something like that, there's different settings where you don't get to transmit as many universes. So I talked about that forward error connection and things like that. So it's not that it wouldn't be suited to wireless control. You would just do your wireless control to the scenario. When I look at, am I going to use wireless when I am not, am I not going to use wireless? I look more up at the setup, at the scenario, how much time I have, what else is going on. Those are the things that really dictate to me, do I want to go wireless or do I not? To this day, and we'll see, because now I'm going to get tested. I have not had a scenario that I haven't been able to get wireless signal in. Um, and that includes the install that I did back at City Theatrical where we were working at Penn Station, which Penn Station has Madison Square Garden. There's a police station in the bottom. You know, it's a major transit system. It's right next to a hospital. There's thousands and thousands of people at any given time, and we could still get signal through. So, and I believe it's still installed and still operating. Obviously, I haven't been back in over a year. Um, but if, if, if it can make it there, it can make it anywhere. So um, I would really, for that, again, not a silly question, um, I would really look at how you tailor your wireless control to that environment. Another question is multiverse uh, transmitter ArtNet friendly? It is, yep. It'll speak both streaming ACN and ArtNet. If one runs into a seriously crowded 2.4 megahertz environment, uh, would we have the option to switch to 900 megahertz? Uh, in North America, it would certainly be an option. Um, 
the fixtures themselves, the ones that we're looking at here, they only have the 2.4 gigahertz frequency chip um, built within them. But if you did want to move to a 900 megahertz, you'd have to make sure that your transmitter and your receiver, and City Theatrical have a ton of different receivers, um, are both 900 uh, compatible. So you'd put, for example, a 900 uh, megahertz show baby there, or their node. The nice thing about with the, the node that's uh, is that that does have both radios built in, so you could then choose which way you wanted to go on that one. Cool. And I think that's it for our questions. Well, thanks everybody for joining us today. Um, you know, there's there's always a lot more questions than we can sort of answer in one session, but um, keep the questions coming. You know, we, you know how to get a hold of us. We're on the forums and the website and uh, social media, all these sort of things, or just give us a call, ask the questions. Um, and some questions you might be better off asking City Theatrical as, as Aaron says, hey, they made it. Um, <laughs> but that's not to, to deflect. Um, blame by any means it's to say they're going to be the, the domain experts in, in a lot of these subjects so yeah. all right well thank you so much uh luke and aaron for today's session and i just want to thank all of our attendees for joining us this afternoon join us for our ready set light introducing etc's set light app all right thank you everybody thanks everyone good to see you